Welcome back. This is segment number two for week two of Computer Fundamentals, CIT 100 at the Community College of Allegheny County. The name of our game this week is Operating Systems. Last week we talked about computer hardware and we are building up from hardware and eventually aiming at understanding how to use a bunch of application software. To get there we have to understand what an operating system is and why we're learning about that before we jump into learning about the application software such as word processors, spreadsheets, video editing, and so forth. So you can follow along with me. I will be presenting three independent videos that each match up with an activity or exercise that is found in our module for the week. So let's go ahead and pull up that module together. So here we are. This is our weekly lesson guide. Just make sure I'm recording. So our weekly lesson guide, let's jump down to week two. So as you, uh, when you, uh, before you continue with this video, you should make sure that you have reviewed the Wikipedia page on operating systems, which is a fantastic article about what makes up an operating system and what its role is in a computer because we're now we're going to actually interact with an operating system, probably Microsoft Windows, that's running on your computer. So that means that you have completed step number one, which is watch our introductory video. You have created a word processing document called week two, OS, first name, ID number, and then we are all located on chunk two, module one, learning guide, which I've pulled up right here. You'll see at the top of this are trees that students have uh, created as we've learned about operating systems in person. Exercise three will actually invite you to make your own file system tree. That's where we're going here. Let's start out by reviewing our objectives. What are we hoping to get out of these exercises? I want you to be able to navigate an operating system. I want you to be able to exercise and use its core tools. I want you to be able to understand the file system structure that operating systems use to save and retrieve the files that run both the system as well as our application software. And finally, I'd like you to be able to digest or dissect those files within the file system and understand how big are they, what type are they, what kinds of programs should they work with. These skills will be a foundation for effectively using a whole variety of application software and dealing with problems that may come up as you attempt to do projects with those. So I'd like to begin before we jump into exercise one by reviewing what an operating system is, which you should have a flavor for because you've read the Wikipedia page. Last week we learned about computer hardware and all of those little components that make a computer tick. The operating system is not a physical piece of hardware. It is software, or more um, aptly said, a set of software, meaning instructions that the processor carries out in order to accomplish a task. So an operating system is the go-between that sits in the middle with application software which we actually want to use to do something on a computer and the hardware that we want to use to do that with. So an operating system is our coordinator. It's the manager of what goes on inside a computer. So as you can see on the module guide, I've created a diagram that shows those three layers that we are studying in this course and we're going to zoom in on what are those operating system components. So I'm going to reproduce the essential elements of that diagram here. So application software gets a rectangle up top. So applications now we call everything an app because we want everything to feel modern and phone-like. But applications or uh, user software is ultimately what we want to use. So this would be a word processor, word processing, video playing, and internet. These are all pieces of software that have to run on an operating system. 
for that reason, we call an operating system a platform because it supports the work of an actual application. So in other words, unless you happen to be a computer designer, an operating system is more like a tool that you hope works and it allows you to do the things you want in applications, such as opening a file. If I want to view a video, I need to get that file from the hard disk drive, which is a piece of hardware component, and I need to figure out how to get that from the actual physical device, the hard drive, up into the software that the application knows uh, that can use to actually play that uh, video or those ones and zeros. The data that lives in the hard drive has to make it up to our application somehow. Well, it goes through the operating system. When I save a file or I create a new video and I want to store it in the computer, the operating system is what coordinates that process of figuring out which hard drive. How do I actually tell the hard drive where to put that file? How do I ask the hard drive for a particular file? That's what the operating system does at the macro level. So if we look back at our system diagram, what we're seeing is that within that operating system are a number of individual components that make this go-between process work. And I'm going to walk through those a little bit. Drivers are a little chunk of software code that's inside the operating system that knows how to communicate with specific pieces of hardware. In other words, a driver is code that is written by the manufacturer of a hard drive. So, for example, Western Digital or Seagate. Those are companies that manufacture hard drives. Along with making the physical device, they write code that runs on an operating system, meaning it's specific to an operating system and it allows that operating system to use their piece of hardware, their hard drive. And so a set of drivers comes pre-installed with most operating systems that work with the basic components of a computer. The input devices, the keyboards, the mice, now they include things like videos and in fact even drivers for getting things off of most cameras or phones. Those drivers exist inside the operating system. The next thing we see in our diagram is kind of an interesting word. It's called the kernel. Not the military kernel, not a kernel of truth, but the operating system kernel. The operating system kernel is a very technically sophisticated chunk of computer code that manages the computer's memory. So remember how we talked about a CPU working together with the random access memory? So we can think of CPU and RAM are these closely related components of hardware. The operating system knows how to manage what those two components do. Now let's think about what that means. So if I open up a video, let's say I'm editing a video for one of my classes. Maybe I'm doing a tutorial on operating systems. And I want to edit that video. I want to be able to click on various frames. I want to be able to play the preview and scroll back and review a particular set of seconds of that video. That requires constantly accessing the data of that video. That's where RAM comes in and the kernel. In order to quickly accomplish that task, meaning in order to edit that video without the computer waiting to write data to the physical hard drive, when I load a video with the application, say a video editor, the process involves asking the operating system, hey operating system, I want to run video, say, we'll call it movie1.flv, which is a file type that the VLC media player knows how to read. So if I want to edit movie1.flv and it's currently stored on the hard drive, the process of opening that file means asking the operating system, go to the hard drive operating system, find me this file, and please 
transfer it through the device driver using the kernel's code and save it inside RAM, this random access memory. This is short-term memory. So a human example might be if you're preparing for a test on anatomy. You want to review those um, you know, anatomical parts and put it in your short-term memory. So when you jump into that test, you have those ready to roll so you can uh, provide the answers on the test. Think about it like RAM as the short-term, quick, easily accessible memory of a computer. Now, the process of managing RAM would be quite, quite straightforward if the only thing we were doing was edit movies. But in reality, an operating system has all sorts of programs running at the same time. Say, a web browser and a music player and maybe a notification program. All of those are applications that the operating system has to coordinate. How much space am I going to give each of the applications in the RAM? What happens if the user tries to open up so many programs or so many files that I can't store all of those short-term, I can't store all of that information in short-term memory inside RAM? So the kernel is the mastermind of figuring out how do I keep everybody happy? How do I let certain applications use the CPU when it needs to, but yet if the system has to do a major task, such as a network request comes in to redisplay a web page, the kernel coordinates who gets to use the CPU and who gets to use the RAM. The kernel is not a piece of software that anybody generally interacts with unless you are a computer engineer. But knowing that it's in there is important because it helps us understand why operating systems have gotten better over time. We've gotten much better at writing kernel software that can manage multiple programs and system resources all at the same time. A couple of other things that operating systems do is they are responsible for security security in terms of who can open and delete and edit files and coordinates network security, what kinds of signals from other computers are allowed in, which ones are restricted. So operating systems help with security. We talked about the disk access, so uh, this is a bit redundant, so disk access who gets to write to the hard drive? What if two programs want to write a file to the hard drive at the same time? The operating system will figure out what to do with that. And then finally, what we interact with most is the user interface. So at some level, the operating system has to provide the user a environment in which to run programs, to edit the system settings, and so forth. Let's go ahead and take a peek at some common operating system user interface components. So I am running a laptop that has Windows 10, the Microsoft Corporation's Windows 10 operating system. You can see their magical grand Windows desktop that comes pre-installed. You are looking at the basic user interface that is included with Microsoft Windows. Uh, Windows is considered one of the most widely used desktop computer operating systems. Before I jump into some of the specifics of Microsoft Windows, let's talk a bit about is Microsoft Windows the only operating system and what might make it different than other existing operating systems. So I'm going to scoot over to this far side of the board and think about examples of operating systems. So the one you're most familiar with is Microsoft Windows. Microsoft Windows has been around since the 1980s and it was created by Bill Gates when he started Microsoft and it was designed to run on IBM personal computing machines. So the thing that we need to remember about operating system is they are designed for a set of hardware that computers might have inside of them. So when personal computers were first coming out, the, the type of processor that was installed in normal personal computers that you might have in a business, 
Those were separate than the processors that were used in Apple computers, which was a more expensive and less widely used, but also very popular operating system among computer enthusiasts and particularly media users because they did a great job at designing a wonderful user interface that was far superior to Microsoft Windows. So Microsoft Windows is still around. They have been upgrading their operating system all the way from uh, MS-DOS, which is that command prompt, and then they moved to Windows 95 and 98. Their major upgrade was to launch Windows XP, which was a very successful operating system. They had a couple of duds in there. They tried to roll out an operating system called Windows ME that was such a colossal disaster that most people never upgraded to ME because when they did, their computer stopped running very well. So even though Microsoft Windows was, or Microsoft Corporation was charging people a hundred plus dollars for one single license of their, off, or their Windows operating system, they have not been consistent about making good operating systems. Operating uh, Windows 7, now they start naming them just numbers. Windows 7 was very strong. They had a dud in Windows 8, so everyone skipped over 8, and now we're all upgrading to Windows 10. So Microsoft Windows is its whole ecosystem. It is a proprietary operating system, which means it is closed source. You have to pay Microsoft a fee in order to legally install that chunk of code on your computer. And even if you wanted to, you couldn't go in and dig around inside that kernel. We have no idea about, well, we have some idea, but we aren't supposed to know how that kernel works. We know about drivers because drivers are made by the hardware manufacturers, but the, the true guts, the thing that makes that operating system go, Microsoft has closed up, and the reason they close it up is because they want to be able to charge people license fees in order to run their operating system. I explained that because a major alternative to Microsoft Windows is an operating system that is based on the mainframe operating system called Unix, which ran the super big computer. So if you were running, say, an airline and you had to coordinate thousands of flights and you had to manage all that data across many different sites, you would run a system called Unix. Unix was such a successful system that a group of people decided to design a personal computer based operating system that could run on an individual machine. And the idea with Linux, the uh, X at the end shows that it's in the same general family as Unix. And Linux was designed to be open source and community managed, meaning there's no corporation that controls Linux. Linux is open, meaning you can actually see the guts of the Linux operating system. You can see the kernels, you can rewrite the kernels, you can share those kernels, and you don't have to pay anybody a single dollar because it's not owned by a corporation. Linux was designed in the early 90s by uh, Linus Torvalds and Richard Stallman, who were two of the major architects. And this has become so popular because it's free, it's flexible, it's customizable, that major corporations use Linux almost exclusively, even though we don't, as day-to-day -day users of computers, see that Linux is actually running the uh, computers that we interact with. So for example, uh, Google runs all of its search computers, run the Linux operating system. They don't pay Bill Gates a single dollar. Amazon, for example, Amazon runs a lot more than a shopping a shopping ecosystem. They run something called Amazon Web Services where uh, companies who run some sort of website, uh, anything from a company like FedEx to Target, might run their entire website on Amazon Web Service computers. All of those web service computers run the Linux operating system. So these are two major competing systems. Another thing to know about the Linux operating system is it's so successful that it was uh, re-engineered to run on phones and this became the foundation for the Android operating system. So if you have used an Android device, you are running Linux. Linux is running underneath all of those apps and applications that you have there.
Apple Corporation has also made their own operating system and that's called OS X. Now Apple does not, um, their OS X has been generally very solid but they haven't published as, or they haven't sold as many licensed copies because most people run PC architecture, which means that uh, Apple historically has used a CPU that was fundamentally different in the way that it was built than the computers that ran Microsoft Windows and Linux. So Apple has kind of been its little lone wolf off in the wilderness doing their own thing. So no matter which operating system we're talking about, we can see as we'll go through these exercises that they have many of these components in common. Some of them are easier to use, some of them may have more bugs than others, some of them cost a whole bunch of money, some of them are free, and some of them are designed for people who really want a pleasant user interface experience. So that's an overview of which operating systems are out there and what they have in common. Because the Community College of Allegheny County runs Microsoft Windows and over 90% of the computers that you buy from a store for your personal use run Microsoft Windows, the following exercises will be based on Microsoft Windows 10. I'll also give you some screenshots of Linux, which is the operating system that I use exclusively for my personal and professional work and I'll give you some screenshots of that so you can see that there are many similarities and they do many of the same functions. There's our overview. Now we're going to jump specifically into the lesson or the module exercise number one which says monitoring your computer's health and functions. So the exciting part about operating systems from a computing perspective is there are programs that are built into that operating system that allow us to monitor what the various components of the operating system are doing. So even though we can't read the computer code that might be running Microsoft Windows kernel, we can run a system monitor program that receives information from the kernel about how much work is the CPU doing? How much RAM do I have left? Which of these programs is using the most of my RAM? What if an uh, application stops running? How do we tell the operating system, hey, let's chop that program out. It's not working. I need to clear it from the system and try again. That set of programs is called the Windows System Monitor. And let's all pull that up on our computer together and the step-by-step -step guide I gave you in, ex in uh, exercise one gives you the shortcut keys for running this. You can also come down to your Windows button and type Task Manager, which will open up a window that looks like this. I'm going to clear my screen so we can focus on this one at a time. I'm going to make it nice and big so that we can see what's going on. I'm also going to pull up the magnifier so I can zoom in. So when we open the task manager, the first thing that you might need to do is click the down arrow to see more details. Uh, one of Microsoft's ways of working their operating system is they generally give you the least amount of information possible to start with and then you have to click buttons in order to see a more expanded version of this information. So we're going to click our button and we're going to say, hey, we want to see all of the guts that's going on inside this system. So already, we can get a sense just by looking at this top bar, we can see a percentage of the CPU's overall horsepower, you could say, that's being used currently. Now what you'll notice is I have a program that is consuming 16 on average, 16 to 18 percent of all of my available computing resources. This is a mildly resource intensive process. So from moment to moment, 15% of my CPU is being used to capture the screen, the digital image of the screen, process it into a video file, and then write that video file onto or into RAM. And then when I'm done recording it, it will dump it onto the hard drive so I can save it and move it around. You'll notice that I can see a list of the other apps the other applications that are currently running. For example, Chromium is the web browser that I prefer to use and it's not doing anything. See, if we look at my web page, 
there is nothing actively going on on my web page. It's just displaying static text. So from moment to moment, Chromium is not using any system resources in the processor. You can notice that 45.2 megabytes of memory, so that's RAM, is being used to store the, the static information about the, uh, the web browser. Now, what I'd like you to do, as I describe in exercise one, is I want you to run your computer and to carry out some tasks and watch on the system monitor how our resources are being used when you change what the various applications do. So, for example, if I play a, a YouTube video, for example, one of the videos for this class, we might expect that the video playing process will take more CPU resources. Instead of zero, that'll probably jump up to some percentage. You'll also find that the memory used by that browser increases because it is saving some of that information that is displaying on the screen into the RAM so it can be easily sent out to the display and so forth. So as I explain in the step-by-step -step guide, once you have the task manager open, you can actually open in a, um, another window called the, uh, let's see, where is it? Under performance, you can open resource monitor, which is a more detailed tool of seeing what processes are running uh, and which ones are, uh, you get more information about the, uh, the uh, process ID. It gives you more debugging information that you probably won't use on a day-to-day -day basis unless you are dealing with a troublesome application that tends to crash or is programmed poorly and uses too many system resources. So it's fun to pull that up because you can see a graph over time as we change what we do on the computer. So we got this baseline. I'm doing the recording of the screen. So that's taking up some processing power. Uh, there are Windows is, is known for kind of having a bunch of background processes that support what the operating system does, like a security program that's actually running in the background, even though you're not interacting with it. The operating system is monitoring that program and it's allocating that program system resources. So without further ado, let us click a link in our weekly guide to open a YouTube video and let's watch what the monitor does. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move my web browser over to the right and then we have our system monitor here. So let's go ahead and click back to weekly guides and let's open this video. So here's our um, Eric explores the steering system in a truck. So watch how Chromium now is using 12.9% of the system resources because as it's running this video, it has to pull information from the web. It has to process that information, figure out how to move it into RAM, ship some things out to the display, and so forth. Now, one thing that you'll notice if we go to the performance tab is see we can see that spike. This is the spike that the processor, uh, we had to do a bunch of activity, almost 100% utilization to load that video. Now that the video is playing, it doesn't have to work quite as hard just to continue streaming those bits and getting them to the monitor. What you'll also notice is my memory ticked up just a bit. Uh, I didn't save a whole lot into RAM because I'm streaming that video from the internet and it's probably not saving that video into RAM um, uh, to, to any substantial extent. Now we can use the system monitor to compare the resource intensi uh, the intensity of resource use by various programs. So I'm going to ask you to tinker with this. Try some different programs, programs that you think are very small. For example, I could open Microsoft Paint and now I can watch what happens when I open Paint. I got a little spike and then it dropped down because it's not very hard to load the Paint program. You'll notice that with Paint just sitting there, it's only 9 megabytes to run Paint. And because I'm not painting anything, it doesn't take any processing power. But let's try something like uh, Microsoft Word, which is a great big program that has lots of little components. So I can open that blank document, and let's take a peek at what happened 
to that. So we can see Microsoft Word takes 30 megabytes of memory and uh, we can even click, right click the Microsoft Word and say resource values. I can say memory percent. So we can see that out of the 8 gigabytes, if I come here to performance, I can see I have 7.7% are 7.7 .7 gigabytes of available memory, which is about the minimum number of gigabytes of memory that you want to have in RAM running a modern day operating system like Windows. And common tasks, see I'm not doing hardly anything on this computer and I'm already using up 38 percent of the memory. And uh, if you do more graphic intensive applications, so picture editing, video editing, that involves saving a bunch of files temporarily into RAM and having more memory will prevent the computer from slowing down. As our percentage of RAM is used up, so if we are nearly all of our RAM is used up by various applications, the processing of any new information becomes much slower because the computer is actually being very tricky in that it will convert some little chunk of my hard drive into being fake RAM. It's much slower because it lives on the hard drive but it keeps our system running instead of crashing. Again, this is one of the innovations that has come up in recent years as being really good at transferring RAM to the hard drive in the case that everything gets filled up. And so we can see that I loaded Microsoft Word. Uh, let's see if I can find some other resource intensive programs. Microsoft Access is a great big program. So you can see when I loaded Access up, I had a big spike. I can see that my process monitor um, shows that it's not using very much RAM because I haven't opened any databases. So I could come here and I could say create this sample database. So as I'm carrying out these processes, notice it's going to take some time to open this database and we can see a more sustained use of that processor as Microsoft Access demands the time of the processor to get itself all set up. So this is cool. I want you to experiment with this. I want you to document some of your learning. I want you to find a program that uses a bunch of resources and a program that uses relatively small number of resources and compare uh, what we learn about how computers work based on that experimentation. So be creative. Some students have found that it's fun to try to load up all of their RAM so you could open up a bunch of YouTube videos and that sometimes will uh, require that the processor runs a lot more. So I'm loading up YouTube. You can see that if I jump back to my task manager, I'm seeing the spikes in my processor use. Again, this is cool because we're getting a chance to see that the application works through the operating system to get down to our underlying resources. And that wraps it up for my overview of exercise one of our operating system module monitoring your system's resources with the system monitor.